Welcome to Tech Tales. I'm Corbin Davenport. And I'm Cody Toombs. And today we're here for the last episode in our series on OS2, where we've been talking about the operating system that Microsoft and IBM worked on together until they didn't, and then IBM kept working on it, and then they stopped. And now we're looking at what happened after IBM stopped. If you haven't listened to the previous episodes we've done about OS2, you should go do that because this is kind of like you're jumping into the last Marvel movie without seeing any previous Marvel movies. And you might be a little bit confused. I mean, that's not the worst situation with, let's say, Ant-Man. It's still, yeah, we're still in for a fun time. You're just missing out on maybe a little bit of context. So the last episode, we talked about how Windows 95 came out, and that was sort of the final nail in the coffin for OS 2. Around 2001, 2002 is when IBM completely ended development of OS 2. And then in 2005 is when they stopped selling it, and 2006 is when mainstream support for OS 2 ended. But OS 2 kind of had a life after death. There were calls for IBM to release OS2 as open source, or at least parts of it as open source. One website called os2world.com created a petition in 2005, which called on IBM to make OS2 partially or fully open source. And that petition had over 13,000 signatures by the end of that year. And I will send you a snippet of the petition for you to read for us. Shocking. People want closed source software to be open source, and they were able to get signatures for this. <laughs> and Yeah. <clears throat> it is known that OS2 isn't well supported by companies that make software or by individual developers, and OS2 faces a high possibility of being replaced and or withdrawn from the market. Hence this petition to IBM so the much-loved OS2 technology can be freely distributed and developed around the world. We understand that making OS2 open source will be beneficial for the IBM customers as well as for IBM if the hurdle of third-party supplied code can be overcome. To this end, we are willing to contribute our own efforts. We know that IBM faces a problem of making OS2 open source because of the private sources from the third-party companies. What we ask of IBM is to release as much of the source as possible and list the OS2 components that need an open source replacement. With a list of components that need to be replaced, companies interested in OS2 or individual developers can create open source software to fill these holes in the OS. As far as petitions to large companies go, this one seems pretty level-headed. Like it's not it's not like all the everything we see on like change.org <laughs> yeah. where there's just really silly goals sometimes on purpose being silly. And it doesn't seem realistic at all. This one is like, we know there's parts of OS2 that IBM probably doesn't own. IBM, could you just give us what you can and we'll we'll do the rest? Yeah, it's it's not the most unreasonable statement, for sure. Uh, I mean, outside of the fact that they're asking IBM to open source something that they've spent how many obscene millions on this project? So, you know, understandably, like some companies would look at that and say, yeah, we're not doing that. It's ours. Thanks, though. <laughs> but I guess if if you're effectively abandoning it and you really don't see any any course of action that's going to make it profitable or useful to you, you know, I, I could see doing this. Although the the issue with OS2 is that I would love to know how much of it that like IBM has 100% of their rights to, because I feel like it's almost nothing. <laughs> you know, the first, the first two versions were developed very closely with Microsoft. So there's a lot of Microsoft code everywhere. If they did do this, then you would go to the source repository for OS2 and it would be like three files. <laughs> <laughs> An IBM spokesperson did say in July of 2005, quote, it's an expensive proposition given the intellectual property involved as well as the prospect of distracting anyone from Linux, quote. So I know we've talked a lot in this series about where OS2 did not succeed. 
right? It did not succeed in the home market where it was trying to compete with Windows. It didn't really succeed in a lot of corporate environments, but there were places where OS2 did extremely well. And obviously that becomes a problem when OS2 is discontinued because now all of these devices are on a uh, dead platform, essentially. Mm -hmm. So weirdly, the place that OS2 seemed to do the best in, from what I can tell, is uh, running on ATMs. I found a report from Dove Consulting estimated that 95% of ATMs in 2003 were running OS2. And I don't know if that's 95% of ATMs in like just the US or the entire world, but regardless, that's a lot of ATMs. Well, it, what a lot of that obviously tracks down to is there aren't that many companies that would build ATM software. It's one of those things you just don't need very many of. And so, yeah, one company, no doubt, bought into OS2. They they made ATM software and they pitched it and sold it to probably all the major names. And as a result, this this is how you end up with a situation like this. I even found a little bit more specific information on this. So two companies, NCR and Diebold, which were producing most of the ATMs in the United States at this time, did not stop selling ATMs with OS2 until 2006. So up until the year where IBM ended mainstream support for OS2, they were still selling new ATMs to banks with OS2. And Diebold estimated around half of their company's ATMs in 2005 were still on OS2. Also, the Brazilian banking giant Banco de Brazil started migrating its fleet of around 40,000 ATMs to Linux in 2008. And before that point, a lot of those were running OS2, or, or some of the really old ones were on DOS, but a pretty big chunk of those 40,000 were on OS2. This kind of speaks to the area where OS2 probably worked out the best during its lifetime, which was as a embedded operating system os2 especially after like warp 3 ish like around the time windows 95 was getting ready to release there weren't many options for an embedded operating system that had a lot of features and was stable one of the most prolific uses of os2 was actually in the new york city subway system in the mid 90s New York City rolled out its MetroCard system where you could get on trains with this um, like credit card type card instead of using subway tokens or something else. And everything powering that system, like the card readers, the backend servers for managing that, were all running OS2. At least some of those systems stayed in place until New York City finished rolling out its contactless cards which was last year in 2020. So OS2 was powering those systems for a long time and apparently worked pretty well. Also, I found another article that mentioned Safeway supermarkets used OS2 on their checkout systems as recently as 2012. So OS2 definitely had pretty good market share in the embedded industry around the time it was discontinued and a little bit before then. The irony is... It, everything you just named, it's all the systems that I actually consider to be the ones that work the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how it always goes. And again, like OS2 had this really good reputation for being a stable platform and also having relatively low system requirements. So obviously, like when we talked about when OS2 was first introduced, the main problem was that it had pretty high system requirements. By the time you got to like the mid to late 90s, like you could run OS2 on anything. It was fine. Well, yeah. If you're not actively developing the OS and adding a bunch yeah. of features, <laughs> yeah. naturally at a certain point, your uh, your hardware standard is definitely going to, uh, I don't know how to, how to finish that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like this is a system that definitely still has 16 bit codes in places. Oh yeah. So because of all the embedded systems that are still running OS2 around the time when it was discontinued, 
plus just the group of people who were using OS2 on their home computers or office equipment or whatever and didn't really want to switch. Between those two markets, there was potential for someone to pick up where IBM left off. So this is when a IT service management company called Serenity Systems sort of picks up OS2 development, but in like this kind of a weird way. So Cody, can you explain to the best of your ability what a thin client is? The thing about a thin client, what you're basically doing is having a very, very lightweight piece of software and generally some pretty lightweight hardware on one side. And this is what people interact with. That thing client then talks to something somewhere else, effectively a server or uh, not maybe not necessarily a server in the sense that we think of it, but some sort of system where what it's going to do is all the heavy lifting, not just necessarily the heavy lifting of processing, again, like you would expect with a server, but sometimes even the heavy lifting of, let's say, rendering the interface. It's sort of like the whole computer is living on a remote system, and the thing client's job is just to kind of mirror that. And, and, and it, differ, it differs. Like, some thing clients it basically are nothing more than a mirroring service. Others are sort of more like a traditional computer. They have some operation ha happening locally and they just put a lot of the processing needs on a remote system. So it can vary a little bit, but that's that's sort of the idea. Right. Like generally you have like a very not powerful computer that the person is interacting with and then somewhere else is something with more horsepower that is driving some or maybe all of the tasks. Yeah, and thing clients were one of those things that uh, for a number of years, people were convinced would be the future of computing. And we've kind of gone a little towards that at times, and then we've backslid away from that as small mobile technology really advanced and improved. And then we occasionally slide back in the direction of thing clients. I mean, it, you know, taking a, taking a modern example of that, Really, Stadia and all the other game streaming services are effectively the thin client model. Yeah, exactly. So Serenity Systems had already worked with IBM in the past on a thin client version of OS2 intended for just connecting to servers, like you said. IBM released a final version of OS2 Warp Server for eBusiness, which was unofficially called OS2 Warp 4.5. And that update had a couple really nice improvements, like um, a new file system, that were never ported to regular OS2. So Serenity basically asks IBM if they can make a updated thin client version of OS2. And IBM actually agrees to this, even though in the past, you know, we talked about in the last episode how one of the larger third-party developers for OS2 asked IBM if it could take over OS2 development and IBM said no, but this time they say yes to Serenity systems. So Serenity starts working on this updated thin client for OS2 that has those few handful of changes that IBM released for the server, but never for like home computers. And they're working on that and they start talking with the community of people that are still using OS2 on their home computers or in their small business or whatever. And they're kind of telling Serenity, like, can we get, like, not a thin client, please? <laughs> like, can we just get, like, a full regular OS2 update? That'd be kind of cool. So then this project that was kind of intended to be, like, just an updated thin client that, like, IT people would be installing in businesses sort of just becomes, like, a spiritual successor OS2 update that is officially licensed from IBM. And this final product, which ends up being called Ecom Station, which is a terrible name. It is, but I have actually heard that name. I don't think I realized that was OS2. <laughs> yep, yep, it was. So Ecom Station 1.0 is released in July of 2001. So this is around the time IBM was sort of 
ending mainstream development for OS2. This was a few years before it was completely discontinued. So there is a little bit of like overlap between the lifetime of OS2 and the lifetime of like these forks. So I will send you a screenshot of Ecom Station 1.0 that you can look at. Wow, that is a busy screen. <laughs> yeah, they got a lot of things open. This was from a um, a review someone did for Ecom Station, and that was one of the screenshots where they were like, look at everything I can do. It, one thing that is so funny to me about looking at this, it reminds me of one of those things where you you take all the interface elements and try to recreate them in like a web browser all of like the font is weirdly smushed it is this weird combination of like early 90s interface development and just a hint of like turn of the millennium design because yeah you have the same like gray windows but then you also have like drop shadows and gradients on a couple of the buttons mm-hmm the title bar which also the title bar has a gradient that stretches all the way across except it stops at the icon on the far left and then it stops for the the window chrome buttons on the far right yeah this looks very similar to the final updates for os2 warp i think serenity systems just they did a couple theme tweaks and i believe they uh, updated all the icons but for the most part like it kind of just looks like os2 so ecom station 1.0 had a new installer compared to os2 war it had a slightly updated desktop layout with new icons it had customizable graphics effects it had new system dialogues and it had support for ibm's journaled file system or jfs and that was one of the last things that ibm updated in its server OS2, but didn't roll out to normal home computer OS2. Also, Ecom Station included some software that was previously commercial, including Lotus Smart Suite and IBM Desktop on Call. And this whole package cost uh, $359 for a personal license. So this was not not cheap. They were really, I guess they were really nickel and diming the, the handful of people who wanted a updated OS2. There is that whole thing where when people are desperate, they'll pay. Oh, yeah. It's an unfortunate truth, but if you need to, you'll take it. You'll take that deal. You want a free operating system that looks terrible? Uh, go go download Debian. <laughs> yeah. So I have a snippet of a review for you to read from Robert Bassler for the OS2 eZine magazine. Now that I have Ecom Station up and running, I'm really glad I took the time. It runs faster, is prettier, and has a number of new features that make it a very worthwhile upgrade. The most noticeable difference between ECS and IBM versions of OS2 is the look of the system. ECS has nice water drop buttons in the corner of the windows for close, minimize, and maximize, nice shaded icons on the smart center, and beautiful new icons for just about every other icon in the GUI. I would like to have seen more options in the ECS theme manager, but it is funny to be able to set ECS to show window style buttons. One of the most positive things about ECS is that it is very much a result of a community effort. As you look through the product, you will see a lot of familiar names. Serenity has gone to some considerable effort to bring a lot of independent OS2 projects together into a manageable whole that is overall a big improvement over the plain IBM product. Some people have criticized ECS that it is just IBM's convenience pack one with a bunch of bundled software that you can get free elsewhere. While this is somewhat true if you ignore things like Smart Suite, the scanning software, and other commercial products included, ECS is definitely a case where the product is more than just the sum of its parts. With IBM finally talking about dates for the end of OS2 support, Serenity seems like the best hope individual users have to continue to enjoy the reliability of OS2 while receiving new features, drivers, and fixes to support changes in hardware and software as they advance on other platforms. Without an aggregating entity to represent the mass of general OS2 users to IBM and to enter into contracts to get problem areas fixed, the individual user is pretty much out of luck trying to get IBM to fix anything. 
so yeah, Ecom Station is it's almost like a remastered video game if OS2 was the video game. Sort of a collection of all the patches IBM made and never quite released for normal people, plus a lot of commercial software people liked, plus a handful of changes that Serenity Systems made itself that included a couple design tweaks, some new drivers, stuff like that. If at this point you're really just begging for any little continued support, you're kind of going to be happy with whatever comes. Yeah. So Ecom Station 1.0 came out in July 2001. In April of 2003, we got version 1.1. So pretty slow development cycle here. <laughs> Um, and this package cost $199, or if you had 1.8, you could upgrade for $59. This update added limited read-only support for NTFS, so you could read Windows partitions. It had a new web browser now based on the Mozilla application suite instead of Netscape. It included, Cody, you'll love this, it included Flash 4. Oof. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's a selling point, Serenity. I'm sorry. The installation process was a little bit better, and it added virtual desktop support. So, you know, how long did it take Windows to add that? That was in that was in Windows 10, I think. That's when it was added. Wait, really? Windows I th- Windows didn't have virtual desktops before 10? Yes, it was wow. Windows 10. <laughs> I, I know that was a thing in Linux, like, forever. Oh, yeah. And the the thing is, I remember that being a thing in Mac OS. Like, I don't necessarily know it was there in, like, Snow Leopard, but I think it was. Or very close to it. Once again, OS 2 is innovating at an incredible pace. <laughs> <laughs> it It tries a whole bunch of stuff, but no one really wants to use it. So yeah, that was Ecom Station 1.1. Not really a lot of new stuff. And this was 2003, so we were firmly into the Windows XP era. So it took a little while for that 1.1 update to come out. But uh, Ecom Station 2.0, can you guess when maybe that was released, how long that might have uh, been in the oven? Well, as we record this, it's 2021. I'm guessing, what, nine months ago? (laughs) (laughs) No. First, tell me what's included, because I think that says a lot. So Ecom Station 2.0 added ACPI support, so it could it had better power management, and it also added the ability to boot from partitions using the IBM JFS file system. It had um, Samba support, so it could talk to Windows drives on the network. Uh, it had multiple user profiles. You could have hard drives up to two terabytes. Uh, it had more graphics drivers. Yeah, just all, all that stuff. Okay. Half of these things sound like things that would have only come about because you needed, like because of a new, a brand new or relatively new requirement or need for them. Again, I, I'm picturing so much of this being associated with like new ATM hardware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i kid well, you not like every well, single thing you just listed it's like yeah i can see why this might be relevant to an atm or maybe like a random server so i'm gonna guess five years uh actually slightly more so ecom station 1.1 came out in april of 2003 version 2.0 comes out in may of 2010 i i knew it was going to be a while not just because you kind of hinted at it but also just because like i said uh, all of these things feel like there's a demand for this stuff we'll get to it when we get to it and eventually they were just like all right we have enough here let's let's do our v2 so that was ecom station 2.0 there was a another minor update 2.1 in may of 2011 and that just had a couple minor fixes and some updates to the software that shipped with Ecom Station. And this ends up being the last update released by Serenity Systems. This was the this is still the last official update for Ecom Station. I think you can still buy it technically, but probably shouldn't because there's it, it doesn't really it's not helpful at this point. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't try to find a page to purchase it. 
Well, I, I did find I did find the website for it that's still online, and I assume it's still taking orders if the website is up. I can imagine there's some random IT person there who hasn't looked at it in like five years, and all of a sudden an order would show up, and they'd be like, "Wait, where'd this come from? <laughs> what is this? I've never seen this before." <laughs> yeah. So someone bought this. We sell this. Wait, we're that company. So after that point, there maybe aren't that many people still into OS2, but there's enough of them where they are annoyed that there's no more ecom station updates. So in July of 2014, a new company called Arca Noe is founded by some former developers at ecom station who weren't happy with the lack of ongoing updates, and they obtained a new license from IBM to continue OS2 development which I would I would love to have been in that room when that happened or on that call when they were talking to IBM. Just the thought of like someone calling up some salesperson at IBM being like, hey, you remember OS2? And IBM's like, uh, I think. I imagine the poor person that works at IBM who, who every few years gets a call and it's somebody saying, hey, uh, can, can we do something with this? And they've just got to be sitting there going, please, no, no more. Stop making me do this. Their nightmare is every day they're going to come into work. Every single day they come into work terrified that they've got another email saying, so remember that OS2 thing? Yeah. Yeah. Can we do something with that? Every time they need to review the license, they get this giant old book out from behind the desk (laughs) it's smacking on the desk and dust flies everywhere there's some old office where like one random dude is just asleep it turns out he's the lawyer that always handles this particular (laughs) task and every someone knocks on the door he slowly wakes up looks up and puts on his glasses at this point He has to wipe them down because he hasn't used them in years. And then he asks the question through barely grinning teeth. Is it time? (laughs) Why have you (laughs) awoken me? (laughs) Yes. It's like someone needs to license OS2 again. Like, ah, okay, bring them in. (laughs) I I will see them. I'm sure that's exactly how that went. No, I'm. If anything, I'm sure they have some poor interns handling this. Like we weren't even alive when OS2 was out. Yeah. Why are you making us do this? Yeah. <laughs> the, every time they get a call, they have to do a Google search for what OS2 is because they have no <laughs> idea what the person's talking about. Like, oh wait, exactly. I oh we made this. Wait, I think my grandpa told me about this. <laughs> uh, so. So yeah, they get the license from IBM, probably in a very funny way, as we've described, and they start working on a new fork of OS2 called Blue Lion, and it's later renamed to Arca OS. So Arca OS 5.0, which is the first version, I guess they're going based on the OS2 number scheme, uh, this comes out in May of 2017. The pricing was $129 for the personal edition. So if you wanted to buy this and run it on your own computer or in VirtualBox or whatever, you could buy it for $130. Or commercial licensing was $229 per license. So I I really hope no companies are relying heavily on OS2 at this point. But if if they were, they could they could buy that. So this update had new drivers ported from FreeBSD. It had a new generic audio driver based on the ALSA technology from the Linux kernel. It used the Linux CUPS printing system for printer support so it could talk to modern printers and all that fun stuff. It had an updated Odin32 compatibility layer that was partially based on code from the Wine project which allowed some Windows programs to run unmodified. It included Mozilla Firefox and Thunderbird. It had Apache OpenOffice, OpenJDK 6, so you could run Java apps. It also had VirtualBox guest editions, so if you were running it in a virtual machine, it would run somewhat well. And, of course, because this is still OS2, 
it could run DOS and Windows 3.0 software. It's very funny to me that you could that you can buy a operating system today that has official license support for Windows 3.0 software. <laughs> because there are in fact definitely people who need this. I mean, I'm being sarcastic ish. But you know there are absolutely people who need this. So I I did go through the website for Arca OS, and they talk about a couple different use cases for this. The main one is running OS2 software on like moderately recent hardware. They also talk about on their website that like this is a pretty good way to run like classic PC games because it can run just about all DOS software and Windows 3.0 applications. But again, like there are probably better ways to do that now, but there seems to be enough people buying it that they can continue development. Novelty is king, dude. I was going through some of like the forums where people who use this talk to each other, and there is definitely an aspect of like, it's just fun. Like, oh, cool. I'm using a platform that can still run DOS software, but it also can talk to like my printers and runs Firefox. That's kind of fun. So even though this has like some modern ish software, it's also pretty clear that ArcOS is really running into the limitations of the OS2 code base, especially because when they're licensing it from IBM and when Ecom station license it from IBM, they're not getting all of the source code to work with. Like IBM is holding on to the code for some of the lower level components. So they still can't change a lot of OS2 from what I understand. OS2 is still a 32-bit operating system. It's still primarily made for a single user environment. Like there's not really a separation between a user account and the root account. You know, there's a, there's a lot of legacy stuff like that that is probably difficult to maintain I found one blog post where some people were talking about how anything newer than I think like Firefox 40, some version around there, which was a couple years ago, they can't port anything newer than that to OS2 because it's when Mozilla started to use the Rust programming language and there's no Rust tool chain for OS2 Mm -hmm. (laughs) because that's a new programming language. So Right now, there's an effort to port WebKit to OS2 because that's not using Rust. So they're very clearly hitting the wall in a bunch of areas. That's a little bit amusing to read about. But I mean, they're 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 still trucking. You can you can buy ArcOS today. As we record this in late 2021, they're getting close to releasing ArcOS 5.1, which the the main improvement there will be uh, UEFI boot support which it was apparently very difficult to implement, <laughs> uh, judging from the blog posts they've written. Well, if, if for any reason they don't have access to the old code, I could see how that would be one of those things. They might be patching it in or doing something hacky just to get there. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but I remember I was reading one of the, like a progress update for 5.1, and they mentioned that it was pretty difficult to get all of the DOS and Windows compatibility stuff running on UEFI. Because again, like DOS is just a thin layer on top of the PC BIOS. So I'm sure I, it doesn't surprise me at all that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get that to run on something newer. Yeah, at that point, you're you're trying to work around the fact that instruction sets have actually changed. You're working around the fact that some of the basic paradigms of how they interface just simply have become more complicated. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the OS2 story so far. Again, like ArcOS is still ongoing, but that's that's everything I've got. <laughs> Plot twist. In 2044, OS2 will become the most <laughs> used operating system <laughs> in the world. Yeah, I mean, as long as IBM keep licensing it, I guess it will probably stay alive. Researching all of this has been super interesting because I can't think of something like this happening in any other context or or to any other piece of technology. Because there have been a lot of operating systems and platforms and other stuff where the platform never quite competes well, and eventually it's it's discontinued or killed off or something. 
And in some cases, the people who really liked using it basically start from scratch and they like recreate it. That's happened a few times. Like the, the best example of that is BOS, which was, it, it was also a operating system from the 1990s and it never quite hit the mainstream and it was eventually discontinued. And then like a couple parts of it were open sourced. And so the community of people who really liked that started to work on again, and that became Haiku OS, which is still under development. It's, it's pretty impressive actually. And, you know, same thing happened with DOS where Microsoft ended development of DOS and someone decided that they still thought having DOS was helpful. So now we have free DOS, which is a completely open source reverse engineered version. But I can't think of another example of something like that being discontinued, but then the company who made it is giving licenses for other people to continue working on it. Okay, that particular angle, you're right. I, I can't think of any other company that's in that specific scenario. Earlier, though, as you were saying, that you couldn't think of any other piece of technology that has had this kind of continued survival. The first thing that my brain went to was the uh, HTC HD2. <laughs> the phone that infamously yeah. cannot be killed. Yeah. A small part of me was also thinking of Pebble. I don't know if it still is, but there was a period of time where people were absolutely determined to keep Pebble alive. Yeah, like there are so many examples of people finding a piece of software or hardware that they absolutely love and that they want to keep using even after whoever made it originally gave up. But I think OS2 is, is kind of unique here where it's still kind of officially ongoing. Like IBM sanctions the development of Arc OS and they allow the development of ecom station it's that classic thing where something just won't die yeah it's almost like the movie franchise that was good in its first movie and then they did a sequel that was all right you know and, and most of the same people came back and then they kept doing sequels and at this point you're now getting budget actors Mostly people who are probably either just getting started or very much just at the tail end of their career. And progressively, no one realizes that you've now made it to OS 2.7. <laughs> Everyone kind of thought that this ended with like OS 2.3. Like you had the trilogy and it ended and like that was even bad. But here we are. It's it's still going. But unlike the Fast and Furious movies, it didn't somehow make a recovery. <laughs> OS2 is the open season of operating systems. I was aware of there being a first movie that was kind of okay. And then I feel like I never thought about it again. And then I saw the fourth movie or like uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> I remember the, that first movie. And then I think they made like five more. Yeah, yeah, it's it has that sort of children's movie franchise quality to it where you absolutely knew there was a first. You probably were aware of a second. And then it it that's it. Like you mm. didn't know it, but it just kept going. <laughs> oh, Starship Troopers is a good example of that one. I think. I'm pretty sure they kept making those. 